who is the Vice Chancellor of the Islamic Science and Technology University, a great scientist, still a researcher, the chair of this inaugural session and the principal, Professor Yasmin Bashirji, whose warmth made me at home in a place which I consider the Shri, to which she belongs to. You know, sometimes it's very beautiful to understand the importance of yourself and your place when you try to understand that particular word from the etymological point of view. <coughs> so, Shri Nagar. Why Shri Nagar is called Shri Nagar? The convener of this conference, Professor Da, uh, the guest of honor, uh, Professor Muzaffar Ahmed Bhatsa, who has given us a brief history of education in Jammu and Kashmir, uh, started from 1857. But I'll add something from my perspective. Why Srinagar or Jammu Kashmir is Jammu Kashmir and Srinagar is Srinagar. The co-coordinator and my friend, Dr. Mehraz Bhatsa, Dr. Shaviza, sitting over there. All the principals from the different colleges and the participants will be presenting their paper in this conference and the faculty and the students of this college. I congratulate you for two reasons. One, that after NEP 2020, expansion has to take place, whether you accept it or not, whether I like it or not, maybe from the quality point of view, but from the equity point of view, it has to take place in India and in Jammu and Kashmir. And secondly, along with expansion, in education, we call it the opportunity <coughs> of access. The quality is an issue. And from what perspective we need to look at these two words? Why I'm congratulating the coordinator and the convener? Because very recently, I had the opportunity to deliver one talk in National Institute of Educational Planning and Administration, NEPA, at Delhi. And almost on a similar topic, they organized this conference where the city of Sussex from London, four people from that you know, city participated in that, and I was also invited. And research scholars from five central universities were participating and the faculty. So see what is happening in Delhi, which is considered one of the think tanks in the field of higher education, what they are thinking over there if the similar kind of thinking is going on in India, in one of the nook and corner of India, so the college deserve a huge round of applause. Please applaud for that. <laughs> well, so sir, uh, how much time I have? 20, 25 minutes, fine. So I'll try to uh, summarize this. So I had, uh, I mean, last night only, I thought that, I mean, should I repeat whatever I'm telling since last two years or something else I need to talk about? So, in brief, we'll try to understand what education is or how education has been conceptualized in the latest document in India, in general, and higher education in particular. And more importantly, how to contextualize the phenomena of education and higher education in the context of Jammu and Kashmir. And the third thing, that is the expansion and the quality in higher education, particularly in the context of Jammu and Kashmir. And last but not the least, what is needed. Before I summarize, for me, there are two important needs that we educationists must concentrate. 
educationist as a teacher or the researcher or the educational administrator. And that is the systemic reform and institutional engagements. If we don't do this, I don't think we'll be able to do justice with the concept of access, equity, and equality in the field of higher education. <coughs> well, if you don't go by the history of the documents that in India after independence, uh, India has produced, or even before independence, Professor Muzaffar uh, Bhatsa was correct that the modern education in India, it is a considered, starts from 1857. And he has given you a brief history how it started in Jammu and Kashmir. But so, I don't think that the education of history starts only after Britishers came. So much, much older. And you'll be surprised what is the contribution of Kashmir in that. Wherever I got the opportunity in my life, whether it is a different universities in US or the different universities in Canada, England, Australia, Singapore, etc., etc., very boldly I have said one of the oldest logical system that we have today, it was given by none other than India. And among all those philosophical system, there are six systems of philosophy in India. Nyai, Vaisheshik, Sankh, Yog, <coughs> and Vedanta. After Mimansa. The oldest philosophical system that is called the Nyai, the right reasoning, not Nyai means justice here. The right reasoning. And that was given by India. And one of the greatest scholars in the Nyai tradition, in Nyai philosophy, was produced by none other than Jammu Kashmir itself. <laughs> Who was he? The two bhats are sitting here. <laughs> Isn't it? He was also giant bhat. But I will not be surprised if the young <coughs> people from Kashmir don't know his name. Simply because when we talk history, when we talk it, history of education and education, we don't mention his name at all. So friends, wherever you get the chance, whether you are a student of mathematics, like my, I have done my master in mathematics. And then I did master in education. But my education will always remain incomplete if I don't associate myself with the cultural historical roots of the place to which I belong to. And this is what the beauty of National Education Policy 2020. The moment you talk about education, the first and foremost thing that we all need to do is to relate and contextualize our existence with respect to the historical and cultural rules to which I and you belong to. This is what the uniqueness of, about National Education Policy 2020, the moment we talk about education in general and higher education in particular. And the two greatest works that this Jayant Bhatt in late 9th century, he was born here in Kashmir only, that too in Srinagar, to whom the Honorable Principal belongs to the place, in 820 CE. Despite being one of the richest person in Jammu and Kashmir, he decided to pursue education. And the name of the book is Nyai Manjari and Nyai Kalika. And you know what is a Nyai philosophy? Nyai philosophy doesn't talk about the Mukti, the God, <coughs> right? Salvation. 
It says you can liberate yourself if you are capable to arrive at the right judgment. And for that, what you need is the right kind of logic, which we I need as a mathematics teacher to prove or disprove a particular theorem, which a researcher, who is the chief guest today, while concluding a research statement after conducting research, he needs to conclude it logically, inductively or deductively. The moment we talk about induction and deduction, we say that Francis Bacon's contribution is there, Aristotle's contribution is there. But please read Jane's work. Why? Because the entire Western science says induction is opposite to deduction. So suppose if I belong to the mathematics discipline, I say, okay, what is the nature of mathematics? I say the fundamental nature of mathematics is deductive. If some professor or some students belong to the hardcore science, physics is the only hard science, other are soft sciences, then the science people say, oh, our nature is the inductive in nature because Francis Bacon gave this. You'll be surprised to know much before that our text, our cultural history very clearly say no. And education people are sitting here, they must be teaching methods in education. Induction is opposite to deduction and deduction is opposite to induction. No. You read the neurological system that very clearly says induction and deduction both are the two faces of the same coin. And I can do, because I wrote my PhD thesis on epistemology theory of knowledge, that no induction is a possible in this world without deduction and no deduction is a possible without induction. Only an Indian can claim like this. Similarly, what is the cultural connotation of the concept of the zero? The way Indian mind, and particularly at the moment where I am standing, can understand the cultural connotation of the concept of the zero, I don't think anyone in the world can understand. I remember while lecturing in the University of Riverside, California, I said I come from the land, the land which has given the beautiful concept of the concept of zero to the world. And without the proper conceptualization of zero, the entire paradigm of mathematics is useless. You all know, I don't need to repeat this. Fine. So the latest document very clearly says. Education is a fundamental for achieving full human potential. Developing an equitable and just society and promoting national development. So higher education in India with respect to expansion and particularly quality, this is the first thing. It also says, as far as the expansion is concerned, providing universal access to quality education is a key to India's continued ascent and leadership on the global stage. Now, so what is needed? Needed is, I was so happy when the chair of this inaugural session, she said that this is the college where all students from all the three disciplines, sciences, social sciences, and commerce study here. And that two together, So the multidisciplinary learning and learning how to learn. So whether we are students, we are teachers, or we are researching, how do I learn? What is learning? And for that, the biggest question that you will have to ask, what is the epistemic dimension of learning and knowing? You know, we teach to the students, oh, learning takes place this, 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 this way. And we <coughs> quote all the great psychological minds, Pablo, Thorndike, Skinner, etc., etc. But have you ever asked this question yourself, how do you learn? <coughs> What's your way of learning? What's your style of learning and knowing? So my question 
in front of you is how to think critically and solve problems, how to be creative and multidisciplinary, and how to innovate, adapt, and absorb new materials in novel and changing fields. And here, I'll say, don't wait that the ministry will tell you or the university will tell you. No. Particularly with reference to this college and this district, you will have to decide. If you go by this education policy, you will, will be surprised to know that it very clearly says education must develop not only cognitive capacities, both the foundational capacity, but also the higher order of cognitive capacities. And what are those? If you go by the SDGs, I'll show you that slides. Among all these 17 skills which are needed in 21st century, the best skill is considered the critical thinking skills. And problem solving. But along with these, you need to develop your social, ethical, emotional capacities and dispositions, which in our tradition, in India it is called sanskaras. All human beings study the same discipline, isn't it? But why each human being is different? Sab log wohi padhte hain, usi system se nikalte hain, lekin kuch se aap milenge, to lagega, oh, iske jeevan mein, zindagi, puri zindra dili ke saath hi insaan jee raha hai. Wohi ek dousra bitti, sari degree, sab kuch hai uske paas. लेकिन उसके पास जिंदगी नहीं है जिंदा है आई थिंक इट इज हाई टाइम वेयर एजुकेशन हायर एजुकेशन मस्ट कंसंट्रेट अलोंग विद द नॉलेज डायमेंशन ऑफ ए पर्टिकुलर डिसिप्लिन प्लीज ओरिएंट मी टू द लाइफ फॉर एग्जांपल इफ मैथमेटिक्स डजंट हेल्प मी टू शेप माय पर्सोना व्हेन आई से पर्सोना नॉट द आउटर personality but the inner personality as well then what is the use of studying mathematics which is a considered number one discipline of the world from the epistemic hierarchy point of view what is the use of that if if you are a professor of physics or a student of physics if physics doesn't help you not only to look at the phenomena from the scientific point of view, but look at your life from the scientific point of view. But see what has happened in higher education. Most of the thinkers, they say, rationality has nothing to do with emotionality. Emotionality is a completely different from rationality. No friends. I'm recommending a work. Please read that work when you get the time. And if that book is not there in the library, I request the principal and the worthy faculty, please. There is a thinker called Damasio. He's a neuroscientist. And he has published a book that is called The Descartes Error. The gist of that book is this, that the no rationality is possible in one's life without emotionality, and no emotionality is possible without rationality. You cannot live your life in the two different binaries. Oh, I have to be rational at this point of time and I have to be emotional at this point of time. No. See, the things are changing. So in higher education, fine, you expand. But if you are talking from the quality point of view, you need to keep all these points in perspective. Well, now, I'll not talk about the uh, policy further. But few questions which need to be deliberated at the local level, at the institutional level. And what are those? First, what do you mean by achieving when you say the, the foundational cognitive dimension of human existence? Or what do you mean by multidisciplinarity? Multidisciplinarity is not about combination of subjects. No. Like people interpret, oh, I'm studying physics, 
so I should have chance to study psychology, that's a fine. But what is the psychological dimension of physical reality of this universe and physical reality of a human being? I'm studying, suppose, I'm studying mathematics. And at the same time, I want to understand mathematics from the psychological point of view. What is psychology of numbers? So only by studying psychology and mathematics will, does it mean that you are a multidisciplinary student. How psychology will contribute in overall development and understanding of the mathematical reality of the human existence and the world existence. So how to achieve flexibility at the curriculum and pedagogic level? Unfortunately, in higher education, there is no such provision. As a full writer, I had the chance to go 15 universities in the US. Every university is compulsory. They have a center, they call it teaching learning center. And at least two months, every professor from the junior level to senior level has to spend his or her time in that center to understand how curriculum should be framed. And if I bring change in my curricular dimension, in my discipline, then what will be the suitable pedagogic devices and methodologies to teach that particular concept in the classroom. And only then education will become the uh, holistic one. Anyway, coming to the universe of higher education, you know, people say, if I ask you a very simple question, what is this college? Suppose a person is sitting in Delhi or Bangalore or Hyderabad and if he says, okay, what is government degree college with Bihar? You know, unfortunately, our professors belonging to different disciplines, they don't enter into the larger discourse of education. If I'm an assistant professor in mathematics, I'm confined to the mathematical content that is there in the syllabus, that's all. What is this college? Is the principal, is the college? Are the faculty the college? Are the students the college? The building is the college? What is this college? If you look at and you try to understand what this college is all about from the individualistic point of view or the similar entity point of view, you will not understand. And that's why I say educational world is a combination of <coughs> abstraction and concretization both. So concretely you say, oh, the principal was joined two months back. I was very happy when Dr. Madhazu what was explaining to me. The moment I made a proposal, without asking so many questions, she simply said, can you do it? I said, yes. She said, go ahead. You know, in today's time, educational leadership demands that if there is a doer, allow him or her to do. Rest of the things will happen. See, we all are sitting here. We all are assembled here. And we are discussing and talking about the nature of education in the field of higher education with respect to Jammu and Kashmir. So, education, you all know, relies on cognition, emotion, rationality, logicality, and creativity. Now, ask yourself, when you study, do you confront with all these kind of things? And therefore, if we are students in colleges, you need to ask such questions. I'm going to the college. What is my college? For what purpose I'm going to the college? How my college will contribute in the development of my capacity, capabilities and competencies? Because today's world is all about competencies. Seminar brochure very clearly says, one lakh students pass out every year, but hardly 10% get the Rest you have completed yourself.
So how do educationists work and create a new educational knowledge? Is landscape of education in general and higher education in particular changing as new methods because the disruptive technologies are emerging with full force? Then what is the context? Now there is a danger that the artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data, all these things will change the pedagogy. People are celebrating, oh, we have chat GPT, isn't it? And chat GPT is going to make our life easier. Do you think so? Why a particular medical, sir, has the medical courses? Why the particular medical college in Dan South banned chat GPT? Like in Oxford, proper PPT presentation is a ban. I had to make a presentation for one and a half hours in the Oxford. They said, 45 minutes, sir, you will speak. Fine. And 45 minutes, audience will ask you a question. And for God's sake, no PPT. Unless, until and unless, there is some specific diagram or something that you have to shoot it. Now people are saying, okay, what is coming when artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data, chat GPT and other things? You know, the greatest damage they will do, they will make you dumb. So I'm with that side. I'm not saying chat GPT should not be woke, be there in place. It should be there. But in education, how much freedom should be there for that? If teacher asks you to submit an assignment, you don't apply, you don't write, you don't consult books, chat GPT, you just write the topic, they will prepare the document, you say, sir, this is my assignment. But what about my thinking capacity, my critical thinking? Everything will go down. Last. So, to understand the expansion, we need to, we need to learn how to contextualize. Five minutes more. That's it. Uh, yeah. The first thing is that systemic contextualization. Let any P2020 document say anything. The directorate, Srinagar, says anything, but we all students and we all teachers will have to learn how to conceptualize that systemic reform. Similarly, the knowledge dimension, similarly, the pedagogical contextualization, and more important is institutional contextualization. How those elements can be institutionalized in my institution. And uh, don't forget your, as I said, your historical, socio-cultural contextualization and economic contextualization. So the, 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 the trend that is there, and that's why I congratulated the convener and the coordinator. The first trend that has been seen, there is a UNESCO site of the higher education. I, I was noting down, expansion and massification, and that is going to take place. So every district will have at least one university in Jammu and Kashmir. Most probably, most of the colleges will either be, be the part of the cluster college or the autonomous college. You have to decide your syllabus, you have to decide your curriculum, you have to decide when you are going to conduct your examination, you have to decide when you are going to declare the result. And, and the debate, whether the higher education is a public debate or private good, that is going to hit up in the country. Whether it is a public good or private good. And because as long as there is the impact of ICD, rise of knowledge economy and globalization, that is going to happen. Last but not the least. Uh, I'm leaving this, all these things come directly because so many luminaries are sitting here, the quality asset. You know what has happened? There is a great writing by, uh, and that is called the elusive triangle. On the one hand, we want that every child should have access to higher education in Jammu and Kashmir. On the other, we are saying, oh, quality is not there, particularly with, res with respect to employability. But I think, 
please learn to look at these from the two different angles. When you are talking about accessibility, for example, this morning I came to know there are 31 positions in this college. Why only 21 is filled up? Because it, it will take time. Anything new you start, for example, if you start constructing your house, you can't have everything in one go. And particularly with reference to uh, Indian context. So the access is more important from the equity point of view. Keep quality. Actually, quality is a kind of misnomer in the field of higher education. Why I say so? Because I mean, it's a very difficult to predict what is quality. We have NAC. This college is also NAC assessed, isn't it? Yes. We have NIRF, and we have so many parameters. I still remember that I asked one question to uh, the NAC member peer team that what do you think if you give me A or B or C or even you find that I am unable to you know qualify in that category what qualitative change is going to take place in my college and they had no answer I also go as a NAC PFT to different institutions in India and every time whenever I enter in an institution I ask this question if I assess them and give an A grade or B grade or C grade, what qualitative change will be there in the life of institution of that particular area? Nothing. Why I say? Because educationists are totally confused, including myself, whether quality is a notion or quality is a standard. Unfortunately, throughout the world, only talk quality and try to perceive the phenomena of quality from the perspective of standard. On the contrary, quality is a notion. And that's why for the same shirt, depending on the brand, I pay 200 rupees to 20,000 rupees. From the work point of view, there is no difference. Shirt is a shirt. But why the price of a shirt from the Ban Hussein company differs from the Peter England or from the Arrow or any brand you name it? So that's why I, I, I have mentioned that we have to think in terms of if I have to improve the quality in this in college. Our yardstick will be the standard or the yardstick will be the notion. I always advise in education, quality should be perceived in terms of notion, not a standard. Right? And therefore, uh, there is a famous author who says, Robert Pesce, quality, I know what it is, yet I do not know what it is. And that's why for the same shirt, if I pick up it from the roadside shop, I pay only 500 rupees, 200 rupees or 400 rupees. But the moment I enter into a big showroom, for example, Zara or the Arrow or the Blackberry or you name any big one, Tommy, then I'm ready to pay 5,000 rupees. But do you think the same thing I can apply in the field of education also? No. Never. And that's why the same product from the Oxfords, they are not the same. Same product from the University of Delhi, they will never remain the same. Same product, same students from this college will never remain the same. So friends, my house, you decide your parameter of your quality in terms of notion. Don't depend that somebody else will say. And this is what through these slides I wanted to sh show you. Unfortunately, 
either we perceive term of quality from the economic point of view, employability point of view, consumer market consumerism point of view, but nothing in terms of quality, in terms of how do I purchase <coughs> the concept of a particular thing. So for the time being, from the policy point of view, let's expand higher education. Because only 22, 26 to 27% of the people who pass out at 12th level, they have the opportunity to study and enter into the higher education level. Still we are not 50%. So this is the time, let's expand. But yes, I'm not saying compromise, no. Don't compromise. But initially, you expand, provide the access to our young people, and then concentrate. And don't say that the, some institution in Bangalore, or Hyderabad, or Delhi will dictate you what quality is. For example, our teachers don't have freedom to have his or her own syllabus. But when I was in education, at Central Institute of Himachal Pradesh Dharamshala, we made it sure every teacher of mine will have his or her own syllabus. And students should be consulted in the nature and process and development of the syllabus. I have a beautiful anecdote. I end with that anecdote. Thank you.